Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in case you don't know me, I'm Debbie Myers Martin, and I am the village president here in Olympia Fields. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you for coming today to see our photography exhibit. It is the first that we've ever hosted here in terms of photography. We certainly had other art exhibitions here, but this is our first photography exhibit. And we have Dr. Stanley Selinger to thank for all of those beautiful photographs that were out in the lobby. Uh, if you have not had the opportunity to view all of them, I encourage you to do that. Uh, I met Dr. Selinger um, probably a little over a year ago. And he had published a book of his photographs of fireworks. And I thought that they were just absolutely fascinating and something that I thought the residents of Olympia Fields would enjoy viewing. And so I asked him if he was interested in, in doing an exhibition, and he was, and I thank him for that. Uh, he also has marvelous photographs of his travels across the world. And I found those stories to be absolutely fascinating, and I thought it was something that you would be able to appreciate and enjoy as well. So with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Stanley Selinger. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, start off first by uh, uh, expressing some appreciation and thank yous to uh, people that made this possible. The first person is, is Mayor uh, Debbie Myers Martin, who um, had the vision uh, that uh, create, creative uh, artistic expression uh, exists in the south suburbs and can be appreciated. And it's because of her vision that, that this really moved and came along. I think the mic is, is fine, right? Yeah, it's, it's just going to the camera, that's why. But can you hear me okay? Okay. So... Um, so uh, in, in addition to uh, the mayor, I'd like to uh, uh, acknowledge her husband, Joseph uh, Martin, who made a lot of uh, little uh, the flyers and uh, brochures uh, possible and made uh, the connection with uh, Brookdale Plaza uh, in our early meetings. Uh, in addition to that, um, Betty Jones was uh, extremely valuable and helpful and encouraging and supporting this whole process at many different steps along the way. Um, in addition to that, I want to thank uh, Marsha Fields for putting together all of the, all of the uh, uh, easels that were used and also uh, encouraging and supporting all of that. So uh, the many other people, especially the people at Brookdale Plaza who have been so supportive and helpful in making uh, this a comfortable and, and wonderful atmosphere for all of us. Uh, now, in terms of my photography, um, I love to take photographs that capture the intensity of something that's going on and, and expresses the energy that's in that moment and making it a, a permanent thing for us to appreciate and to see. And as you can see in some of the fireworks, uh, some of that energy we only see a moment of in time. And then our eye uh, loses that and sees the next moment. But the camera captures across many different moments the evolution of all that energy and how, how it really presents to us. And we come to see it at, in another dimension in a way that we didn't even realize was there. And that's one of, I think one of the beauties of discovering what's, uh, what's there that we don't always see. I think that that makes us begin to appreciate many of the subtleties in life in a much more deeper way. And that's what I always try to bring out. Uh, the the uh, uh, the pictures, uh, the photographs that you see out there are of, uh, across a whole range of different things. There's uh, pictures of, of uh, 
animals that are expressing themselves or that have special histories and I'll be glad to share any of those with you. Uh, for instance, the, the chimpanzee uh, is a, a, a rare a Babanos chimpanzee that was, uh, I told some people this before, uh, maybe a thousand years ago in the Congo a river separated the Babanos uh, chimpanzees from all the other chimpanzees that, that existed. And uh, they developed a whole different social structure than all the others. So almost all the chimpanzees that you see in the zoo are very aggressive and male dominated. Those Babanos uh, are female dominated and non-aggressive. Very interesting how they developed a whole different social structure even though they're, they have the, the same backgrounds. Uh, and, and there are many other pictures I'll be glad to, to share um, the histories of, of all of that, that taken sunrise or sunsets, uh, 85,000 feet above sea level, um, to get up four in the morning to take the, uh, the uh, uh, picture of uh, sunrise in Hawaii, um, and so on and so forth. Um, the uh, f first of all, let me let me pause for a moment. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Can you tell us about the silverback? Oh, the the picture uh, of the gorilla, this, uh, which is a silverback gorilla, um, that's the head of its group, and that uh, silverback uh, uh, decides if there's what they should do, where they should move, who should be where, and if there's any conflicts, he's the one that decides this is how it's going to be resolved. And they don't, they don't mess with him. His word is final. And that's just the way it is. It's, and what's fascinating about the gorillas is that, uh, I, 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 did, I didn't have a picture of this here, but when they have a baby gorilla born, for the first, I, th I forget whether it's seven months or nine months, the baby clings to the front of the mother and goes everywhere and sleeps with the mother that way, holding on to the, the front of the mother. There's a tremendous attachment that goes on. So there's a, a tremendous group uh, uh, phenomena that, that, that binds them together. This is very different than the picture, if you, if you saw, of the of the tigers. Actually, that's a, a three-year-old tiger. Uh, they, uh, there's the sisters, the two sisters. And it's very rare to get a picture of, of two tigers in the same frame because they're so territorial and they're always fighting who's going to be the dominant one. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, you, you see them farther apart, but the, but the gorillas or wolves I didn't bring my picture of the wolf, but I have a picture of wolves. It looks like they're they're overlapping, and they're because they're they're more of a pack animal, and they they enjoy the the bonding of being very very close together like that. Can you tell us some of the locations of the uh, The locations are all over. I have one one there that people have described as maybe looking Japanese. It's, it's really in Australia. It's actually in a little island um, uh, off the uh, Great Barrier Reef. And um, uh, that, was, um, uh, that, was, that was one over there. One picture is from uh, a glacier in Alaska. Uh, another uh, picture is from uh, Bryce National uh, uh, park in uh, Utah. That's the uh, one that uh, uh, looks like a basin with with uh, s uh, stones coming up, and it's the, the Indian word for that is hoodoos, and it's a contraction of an, uh, Indian words which mean uh, stones that look like men marching, and it becomes the Indian word hoodoos. Uh, the, the uh, Mormons came in many years later and renamed it Bryce National Park. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's the origin of that. Uh, that's 85, 
hundred feet above sea level. Uh, and that was taken at six in the morning for sunrise. That's why it, it pops out like that. When, now, one of the things about photography is that it, it's a, a lot about capturing light, and the light at different times of the day affects the intensity of the colors and the, and the picture itself. So at sunrise and at sunset, the light really pops. And that's, that's one of the secrets of taking certain kinds of pictures. Uh, another one that illustrates that is the picture of the cave, the swirling cave. That's called the slot cave. In, uh, outside, it's on the Navajo Indian Reservation outside of Page, Arizona. And that was um, uh, taken at 9 in the morning. And the slot cave is, is shaped by water carving <coughs> through the, the cave, and when water in the in the winter freezes at the outside of the cave, it cracks the the stone open. It's amazing, isn't it, how how water freezing can crack stone, and that causes light to come in at different hours of the day, uh, illuminating these these uh, carvings that the water has made in um, in uh, the cave. And so you get the, the light illuminating those shapes very, very differently. Uh, there's uh, what are th some other, uh, yes? Right, your uh, pictures are multi-themed. So what is your doctor? You I have a doctorate in psychology, in clinical psychology. So you've not been a therapist. So I am a therapist. In the real sense. Oh, <coughs> The photography is a passion of mine. However, I'll say this. My master's thesis at Ohio State University was looking at how people looked at photographs of different things and how, what effect it had on their body. So I was measuring their um, skin response, which usually is associated with anxiety, and they would have them rate the pictures on a number of different qualities. For instance, whether they, we call it hedonic tone, which is the beauty of it, or the strength that they thought it had, and um, uh, uh, different kinds of ratings like that. And then, so I did it with the skin response. Somebody else did the same kind of thing with their pupillary response, their eye response, and somebody else did it with their heart. So we kind of pulled all that data together to show what effect these pictures, depending on how you rated them and how you, your experience of a picture affected your body. See, and this is something that you can do subjectively by realizing there's certain pictures that really have this calming effect on you. You, you know that without my having to do research on that. But that's, that's what the research is showing, that certain certain things that you subjectively understand about your reaction to a picture is your strength and, and the value that you can place on that photograph or picture. And that's what you ought to have and build on. I've had uh, patients who, uh, after they work with me for a while, will, will redecorate their office to make sure they have the picture that evokes this calming effect in their, in their office so that they can turn from their desk and see, in the case of this one person I'm thinking of, a beach scene because that's what calmed her down so that she can deal with work in a much better, calmer, uh, easier way. Uh, the um, other thing that I used uh, photographs with uh, in my work as a psychologist is uh, I became actually very, very skilled in using what's called the thematic apperception test. It's known as the TAT. The TAT is a set of pictures that we show, uh, and, uh, we show to people, and we ask them to make a story about the picture. Okay? So the story, I tell them, has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And then I, if they don't come up with all that, I'll ask them questions to elaborate. And uh, based on that, those stories, I can tell how 
they're coping, how they're, what kind of defense mechanisms they're using, what kind of expectations they're having. Now, what, what I discovered by accident, because I had all these photographs and others in my offices, I discovered that people would just come in, see these pictures which are not standardized, like, like the set of TAT pictures I'm talking about, and they would start telling me and reacting to the pictures in these ways. And so I would say, well, tell me a story about that, or what do you think about that? And I would, that would be a projective way that they can discover something that was important and convey it without having to get into the details of, of certain kinds of things. Uh, it's a very interesting thing. You should try it with your children or grandchildren it's, uh, to, to say, here's a picture. Let's make up a story together. I think you'll, you'll discover that it's a fascinating way to, to connect with what's going on under the surface in their minds. You can buy one of my pictures and take it too and do that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. Thank you. Any, any others? can illustrate, yeah. With your fireworks, um, how, wh how, what was the procedure to bring out something that in the normal eye we wouldn't see, but that we saw it through your photograph? Um, well, the fireworks uh, became a, a fascination of mine um, because uh, <laughs> what would happen is I would take pictures and I would bring them in to be developed at a studio and the, um, and the uh, owner of the studio would ask me if he could hang my pictures in his studio and say that they were his. <laughs> and I said, no, you can hang them, but you have to say they're mine. <laughs> um, and I realized when that happened that I was capturing something that was um, taking fireworks, which we often thought about in one way, and uh, capturing them as though they were something else, as though they were abstract art or flowers or something else. Uh, so I spent years, actually, um, getting involved in, in taking pictures of fireworks and perfecting that and getting the eye. The, the real key in a photographer's um, uh, repertoire is to develop your eye so that you're seeing things or anticipating what's going to happen. And so uh, that's part of the, the, the process of, of understanding what you're looking for and just being able to sense what's going on. So I, w I would use a very, I would get very close to the fireworks. I would sit under them. Sometimes I would smell it or feel them falling on my head because I was that close. And um, I would um, have a large lens. Now I use a, a 300 millimeter lens so that I, I have the option of taking a, a fireworks from a wide angle or if I want getting really little chunks of it and seeing how that little chunk evolves over uh, a few seconds or even a minute, okay? Uh, fireworks are very interesting. Uh, origin, if, uh, if you don't, uh, are not aware of it, it, they were developed about 2,000 years ago by the Chinese when they were throwing bamboo chunks into the fire. And bamboo has little pockets of air in it. And so when it heated up, boom, that would explode. And they, they, uh, they thought because the animals, the dogs, would run away whenever that explosion occurred, they said, <laughs> wow, this probably can chase away the evil spirits. So that became something that they would do at all celebrations and weddings to chase away the evil spirits. They would throw all this uh, uh, bamboo into the fire, um, having it explode. Now, people came along, it was mostly the Italians who came along and added different uh, metals, uh, ground up metals, to the bamboo and it became uh, different colors because the different metals had a different color to them. So every, every time you see a different color in the sky in a fireworks, it's because there's a different metal that's involved in that combination. Um, the, um, 
because the Chinese were very adept at realizing that, that this became uh, something they turned into fire arrows, and this, that was actually the origin of the cannon was from the fireworks, uh, because they turned it into a war, uh, into a war uh, weapon. Um, but because now we use it to celebrate in the best way we can. And I think it's, it just fascinates me and many other people to see how our eye doesn't capture the whole evolution of a firework, uh, but a, a camera can see that evolution. That's what, what's such a beautiful thing. We don't realize what's there that we, we really, uh, it's like our unconscious. We, we know, we have an instinct, something's there, but we don't always know what's there. So we have to uh, uh, come to appreciate those things in life that we can't always put our finger on or see, knowing that there's something more complex that's there. Do you have a favorite? Oh, you know, it's it's kind of, it's kind of like saying, uh, you know, which 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 child do you love? You know, you love them all. You know, <laughs> so I mean, you know, there's just. They're just special in because of different things and different qualities. So, I mean, I, I, I love telling the stories about any of them or all of them, uh, all of those photographs, uh, because they all represent something. And what happens, and this is something that I've been, <laughs> it's amazing. I, I heard this from, uh, recently from, uh, it was the head of uh, neuroscience uh, at Harvard. And he uh, was quoting somebody who I had learned about, uh, seemed like a hundred years ago. Uh, Donald Hebb was a psychologist in uh, Canada, and he published a book on how our memories work. Uh, we, he called it the organization of, of behavior. And the famous line that he came up with that everybody is quoting now, I can't believe it, he, he published this in 1949, and now everybody in the last three years is just quoting him. It just amazes me. Uh, what the saying he came up with is, what, what's wired together fires together. So what you, the associations that you wire together from different experiences can fire together. And this is, this is how, um, so when you say what's, what's, uh, what's your favorite or what do you enjoy, it's all the associations that you wire together that fires each other. So the, the, when you see a, a photograph that you like or a picture that you like or have a, a special uh, aroma that you like, it takes you back to all the associations that your brain makes around that time. So if it reminds you of your childhood or a good times or if it reminds you of, of uh, something that you, um, uh, a venture that you took, all that's going to be fired and come up to you again. That's, that's the beauty of the photographs. I think that it, whatever it reminds you of will come, be accessible to you. I yeah. Well, yeah, okay, so the, the reason um, I took more pictures of, of uh, animals than of people uh, is uh, mainly because they, uh, I, I don't have to have them sign a release. <laughs> <laughs> And, and that, that's really the, the major reason. I would love to take pictures. One time I was trying to take pictures of a guy who had collapsed on the street and the police were chasing me away and, and they wouldn't let me take the picture. And um, So I, I just said, you know, it, and then people were going to say, well, you know, do you, did you get a release? And so I just said, you know, it's just easier for me to, to do it this way. Although the one picture I have of, uh, of a hand holding another hand, that's my 29-year-old daughter holding her 99-year-old grandmother's hand. And, uh, cause the <laughs> 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 so, 
Oh, you are sure. <laughs> I was afraid somebody would ask that, right? <laughs> but I, I get certain privileges, I hope. <laughs> yes? Some of your work reminds me of Ansel Adams. Did you study his photography methods? Um, I, I didn't uh, study his photography methods in a formal way, but I have certainly uh, looked at and admired his work and, and other photographers' work as I traveled around the country. Uh, Ansel Adams, for those of you who aren't completely familiar, uh, went to the Grand Canyon and national parks and would just take pictures in black and white almost exclusively of, of the majesty and the awesomeness uh, of the of uh, the outdoors in those uh, in those national parks uh, and uh, you know you can't help but be awed by looking and seeing what he he did and I'm sure it's some some subconscious way it's part of my thinking of, of the beauty and how to get out there and um, one of the things I would love to do is go to uh, the uh, the uh, a national a different national park every year to kind of take pictures. Yeah. Okay. Any any other thoughts or questions? What about the peacock? Oh, the peacock is uh, fascinating. You know what I discovered that the peacock is the national bird of India, uh, and the peacock is just in. I was in San Diego, at the, and it's just peacocks just walking around on the uh, on the streets in the zoo. I mean, it just you know, it's like they own the place. Like you know, I'm just a visitor, and this is their home. You know, just walking in the streets, and it just flared out for me. I couldn't believe it, so I just grabbed my camera and I, and that's happened to me a number of times. I was, I have this uh, amazing silhouette. I went to take pictures, you, you'll be surprised at where I've taken some pictures. On, on I-57, going on to the Dan Ryan, there was some uh, beautiful cherry blossom, or apple blossom trees rather, and I decided one day to drive there and just take a picture, and suddenly this bird appeared, and it's it's like it said to me. I wasn't really hearing this, but it was like I thought to say, "Do you want to take my picture?" And I said, "I sure do." And I took the picture, and it, and it decided to fly off. Well, that's what happened with the peacock. The peacock just walking along the street, and I'm look just standing there looking at it, and it flares itself out. And I say, okay, I'm taking this picture. <laughs> now, the thing, the thing that you have to realize that when somebody be de develops this passion of photography, it could usually take me 25, sometimes 30 minutes to take the picture I want because you're looking at the lighting, you're looking at the background, the foreground, the setting on the camera, how much depth of field you want to have or not have. Um, and uh, there's, you know, is there something distracting? What's the right angle? You're always getting in a position, so it could take that long. In fact, when I when I took my family once to, um, where is it? it? Was in I think it was in was it in Michigan or or was it in in Washington? We went to a botanic gardens in Washington, and. I'm taking pictures, and one time I'm lying on the ground taking a picture of, of a foxglove flower, which, which they make digitalis from. It's a beautiful flower, pink with brown spots in the middle and uh, draws different bugs in that way. And, uh, you know, I'm moving a little dead leaf away, and I'm getting another angle and trying to see should I change my settings. And after I do that, my son says, Dad, can I have... Can I take a picture with the camera? And I thought, this is terrific. My son's following in my footstep. He wants to take, uh, he wants to, of course you can. I give him the camera, and he takes the camera, pretending to take my picture, turns around and runs away <laughs> because I'm taking too much time <laughs> taking a picture. <laughs> so, 
So that's that's sometimes the the burden and the price that you have when you have a passion like that. <laughs> you know, um, Dr. Sellers, yeah. you sort of answered another question I had about the setting and how it came to be that you, you, you took these photographs, but specifically with the chimpanzee, was this a planned trip? Where was that? That was in San Diego. There's only two. Oh, so yeah. Yeah, that was at the San Diego Zoo, which, which has this whole outdoor thing. And they have a, a barrier, but uh, I had a 300-millimeter lens, so, you know, I was having uh, able to move. And I got as close as I could at the whatever anger, uh, angle I could. Yeah, it was a 300-millimeter telephoto lens, yeah. And uh, uh, so I found that I, I kind of try to get close up. So I, before my 300 millimeter, I was using a 200 millimeter. I'll tell you an interesting story about that. I went to a bird sanctuary in, uh, in Venice, Florida. And this is an Audubon run uh, um, bird sanctuary. And they have a little island there with a moat around it so you can't get closer. And they even have a crocodile in it. So you don't, you don't want, you're not tempted to to go into the water. <laughs> and uh, so I'm, I'm, I go there one year and uh, taking pictures with my 200 millimeter lens. And I notice all the other photographers which travel from all around to take pictures there of the birds were using 300 millimeter lens. So the next year I said, I got to get one a lens like theirs. I come back with next year with a 300 millimeter lens, and they all have 400 and 500 <laughs> millimeter lens. <laughs> so that's it's just you have to make do eventually with what you have and appreciate, you know, that um, there's other possibilities. Um, so, uh, oh, uh, so I, I have a tendency to take pictures close up because I like the intensity of, of what that gives me in a picture. And I, I uh, probably do that. Uh, I have pictures of people too, but they're mostly family and, and close friends. And so I usually get a close up uh, like that or, or rather than, I mean, I do have a lot of, we do have a lot of family, you know, wide angle pictures. But when I really get interested in taking a picture, I'm trying to take the uniqueness of that person or the expression on that person. And that, a, a, a good telephoto lens like that allows me to be across the room and take a picture close up without disturbing the person. That's what I like about it. Yeah, yeah. If you're taking pictures of tigers, you'd like to be across the the the, the room, so to speak, right? Yeah, yeah. The uh, the lions too. That's uh, by the way, that was uh, that was a love bite that he was giving her. It wasn't an aggressive thing. It was, uh, but you don't want to be close to them when when they're being their natural animal selves. Yeah. Yeah, the silverback, the right. silverback. Was he in a position then where he was showing his dominance? I mean, like, were there others right there? When, when he he, he sits he sits dominance? where he wants, and everybody, everything goes on around him, and if he wants to go somewhere else. Actually, you see this in many different uh, animals. I've, I've seen this at the uh, Grand Canyon with... Um, uh, what is it? The the uh, what flies over there? The hawks that they have. They uh, you have a dominant hawk. Uh, you have a hawk sitting on a ledge, and if a more dominant hawk flies by and wants to sit on that ledge, he goes there and pushes that other that first hawk off. So this is yeah. This is I'm the dominant one. You get off of the ledge. This is where I want to sit. And that's the same thing with the silverback. I didn't see him in an aggressive state, but I. I've come to learn about, see that's the beauty of, of doing something like this. You learn about the uniqueness of the world and everything around you. And then it allows you to enjoy the beauty and the complexity of our lives that are going on all around us that we, we just take for granted. And it opens your eyes to appreciate that. I, I have a close friend who lives 
on a mountaintop in San Jose, and um, I was visiting him one year. And he says, well, I, I, every morning I go for a, a little jog around the mountain. You want to come? I said, okay. And we're jogging, and, and I said, oh, Don, you know, look, look at that picture of the, the field and the barn over there. And look at that tree over there as we're dro- ro- jogging along. And I said, look, look at that animal in the, in the background. And he says, I don't believe this. He says, I jog this every day, and you come one day, and you notice these things that I never see. <laughs> see that's the key to be, being a, having a photographic eye. It's not just me. It's, it's developing that photographic eye where you can appreciate all the little aspects, details of life that are so beautiful that we just take for granted. That's what I hope some of my photographs will allow you all to uh, see and appreciate for the future. Okay? Thank you. Well, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Selinger for his photographs and and for allowing us to share some of his experiences. Again, I want to thank you for being here and sharing uh, in this wonderful exhibition. I want to thank Patty Doyle and Brookdale Plaza because they offered uh, the facility and hors d'oeuvres will be ready in about 30 minutes, I think. Is that correct? 30 seconds. Oh, 30 seconds. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> uh, so we want you to share in the hors d'oeuvres and just have a wonderful afternoon. Um, this has been so special for me. Uh, just because I think that uh, the village of Olympia Fields uh, should have these types of events where we can actually enjoy some of the specialties of uh, our residents here in the region. And I am very excited because Dr. Selinger uh, is in a proposed mode to, to start a business here in the village of Olympia Fields, and we're excited about that. Uh, as well as his photography. And I almost felt like uh, we were on the psychologist's couch here because just because you brought so much to your conversation. So again, I thank you for being here today. I hope that you have a wonderful afternoon. And for the ones who uh, came in after Dr. Selinger had started, <coughs> as you view the photographs, he is more than willing to share how he captured that particular photograph. So please feel free to ask him any information that you um, have questions about. So thank you again, and have a good afternoon. I want this uh, photograph. What did it remind you of, Gloria? Heat click and Wuthering Heights and uh, a honeymoon. Uh, your honeymoon right, that you have. Yes. Heat click and Off the coast of Wuthering Heights. Heights. Yeah. And uh, I took this picture in Hawaii at sunrise. Uh, I had to get up at 4 in the morning to get there. And uh, that's uh, you get the uh, shadows on the uh, cliffs and the big island and the uh, light on the water as it was uh, beginning to sun was beginning to come up. I love it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.